So uh, this is a joint talk by Julia Schilling and myself. Uh, Julia is the RA in this project, of which I will present some key results here. And uh, today we're going to focus on media portrayals of COVID-19 in British newspapers. And um, we'll be looking at a sentiment analysis of this discourse in British newspapers. First, I will say a few words about the impact of the pandemic, what's the background, um, then um, I'll present um, briefly or summarize previous research on linguistics and COVID-19, and then I have some research questions for you on COVID-19 and print media in the UK. And in the results, uh, I'll focus on um, our analysis of semantic fields and keywords in COVID-19 discourse over time and on a sentiment analysis. And then I'll discuss the findings and provide a brief conclusion. Now, the COVID-19 pandemic uh, was the most severe global pandemic since the 1918 to 20 Spanish flu pandemic roughly 100 years ago. And the official death toll um, has been estimated by the World Health Organization as approximately 7 million deaths worldwide. However, um, arguably a better estimate of the true impact in terms of mortality is what's called access mortality. So these are uh, that's, that's the mortality not just directly associated with COVID-19, which is hard to estimate and depends on countries' willingness and ability to really track that in detail, which really varies a lot between countries. But access mortality is the total number of deaths directly and indirectly associated with the pandemic, and this is estimated at 21 million worldwide. And there's a lot of variation between countries uh, when it comes to the United Kingdom. Uh, this is, of course, a high-income country, so um, um, globally speaking, um, of course, a very well-developed health system. So um, a comparatively smaller death toll in the UK, but comparing the UK to other high-income countries, such as Germany, for example, if we then look at not just absolute deaths, but also deaths per million inhabitants, then the UK arguably didn't fare that well um, compared to similar countries around the world. In addition to the to the death toll, um, there were, of course, also severe restrictions on public life, such as travel bans, lockdowns, but also importantly, voluntary behavior adjustments. So people adjusted um, their behavior in terms of how often they went outside, how often they mingled with people in public life, and also how often uh, they, they visited uh, doctor's offices. And this is going to be something that will be important in the following. Now, in terms of um, research on public discourse, the importance of the COVID-19 pandemic for people's lives was reflected in public discourse. It was a dominant topic in news and social media and um, researchers that focus on language, not just linguists, but also other fields um, um, sprung into action right away and uh, published research on new words, uh, so-called neologisms, for example, also political communication, persuasion strategies in the media and a range of other topics. And myself, I'm a linguist, um, so you might be wondering why should we as linguists pay attention to this and, and why is this research relevant to also researchers from other fields? So on the one hand, there's a more narrowly defined linguistic interest, so what linguists often uh, like to analyze and understand better is what sort of lexical, word-related and discourse-related innovation and change is going on in language communities. And because of the fundamental impact and the, the novelty um, of the pandemic and many topics associated with it, there was or there has been a lot of lexical and discourse-related innovation and change. So uh, this is something that is worthwhile for linguists to study. But beyond that, we can also try to understand discourse around the pandemic, discourse on topics such as vaccination hesitancy and conspiracy theories around the pandemic. And if we understand that better, of course, that won't help us anymore with the pandemic. But then there are many other areas, um, such as um, the climate crisis, um, or political fragmentation, political polarization, um, um, and other um, um, topics such as xenophobia and migration, where there are somewhat similar debates going on in, in many countries. And we can try and learn from these polarized debates and the discourse around COVID-19 and try to take lessons from that that would help us um, arrive or contribute to a more um, um, uh, 
well-structured debate uh, where we can counter misinformation and polarization in other fields as well. So far, despite the research on COVID-19 discourse, we assess there's been no comprehensive analysis of the discourse around COVID-19. And what we're doing in the larger project is we analyze COVID-19 discourse in the print media and social media, that is Twitter data, in the United Kingdom and Germany, two countries that are fairly similar in some respects, but then when it comes to the response to the pandemic, uh, there were some key differences. And ultimately, we want to determine to what degree public discourse influences or can contribute to explaining healthcare utilization and vaccination rates. So vaccination rates, that's just um, simply how, how many people um, responded to the call to get a COVID-19 vaccine um, and, and possibly a booster as well. And public discourse might play a role there in addition to other factors such as age, education um, and similar sociodemographic factors. And healthcare utilization, that's a concept that refers to how often people use certain um, healthcare services. Um, and, and of course, during the pandemic, some healthcare services were discontinued um, for some time, uh, but then others were continually provided, such as uh, cancer screenings, to give an example. Um, and because of these voluntary behavior adjustments, many people didn't uh, make use of that anymore, which are detrimental consequences. So they were afraid of catching COVID-19 when they would visit the doctor's office. But the consequence in some cases was that people um, were not diagnosed in time and then developed a cancer that could have been avoidable. And there has already been um, um, a certain death toll associated with that. Um, or in other cases, uh, the prognosis um, is now worse because people voluntarily did not make use of the possibility of uh, getting a healthcare screening um, uh, because they were afraid of catching um, the COVID virus. So we want to investigate more broadly also how or to what extent does public discourse around the pandemic contribute to explaining healthcare utilization and how that developed over time alongside other sociodemographic factors. And that's something we're doing in conjunction with our colleagues from the Hamburg Center for Health Economics. Now, in today's talk, I'm going to focus on COVID discourse in British newspapers, and we're going to look at keywords, semantic fields, and sentiment analysis over time. So we're asking, how much does COVID-19 dominate public discourse over time in British newspapers? What are the keywords in COVID-19 discourse? And what sentiments predominate in connection with specific keywords, and how does this develop over time? The data we have comes from 96 British newspapers, so that covers pretty much um, all the um, um, high circulation and medium circulation British newspapers, including online newspapers. And we have data from January 2019 to June 2022, so including the year before the pandemic. And this is going to be important for our bottom-up analysis of keywords during the um, pandemic. We have a sample of more than 10% of all articles from these newspapers, and we only look at articles in English and we remo removed duplicates from the data. The number of words we have per month varies a bit, but it's on average around 15 million, and in total we have more than 400 million words for the entire time span of newspaper language from British newspapers. And I already mentioned that we use the bottom-up approach, and that's in contrast to most research on this and, and other discourse-related topics where uh, many researchers use a top-down approach. That is, they define certain keywords they think or know are relevant, such as COVID or coronavirus um, or vaccination. So they define these keywords, and then they search all the data for, for all the articles or all the all the all the items um, in the data where they find these keywords. And we are using a bottom-up approach by contrast, where we say, okay, we want to find out well what are the keywords that are possibly related to the pandemic. And so how do we do that? Well, first we lemmatize all the data, and then what we did is we contrasted each pre-pandemic month from 2019, so for example, February 2019, with its counterpart during the pandemic, such as February 2020, February 2021, and so on. Um, so we did that on a seasonal level to um, account for 
seasonal changes in discourse. So for example, people in February talk about snow and, and in July, they maybe talk about um, swimming pools and we want to um, um, adjust for that, of course. But then we, we compare these pairs of months all the time, um, multiple comparisons, um, and then we can identify based on log likelihood and log ratio, what keywords occur more frequently and substantially more frequently during the pandemic, and that are thus um, candidates for keywords that are also related to the pandemic. Of course, there were also other events or, or topics in public discourse um, that occurred in 2020 and 2021 that were not related to the pandemic, but many of these candidates that we identified were indeed related to the pandemic. And we had more than one and a half thousand potential keywords of which some are very frequent, and, and then we have many that are of a medium or low frequency. We then manually annotated these for relevance. Are they related to the COVID-19 pandemic or not? And we only retain those that are indeed relevant and assign them to semantic fields. The most frequent semantic fields are COVID-19 names, such as pandemic, coronavirus. Then we have so-called non-pharmaceutical interventions. So these are measures that governments took to um, uh, stem the, the spread of the pandemic or slow the spread of the pandemic, such as lockdown or mask wearing. And then the third semantic field that is also very frequent is vaccination with words such as vaccine or vaccinate. We also have others, as you can see here, but these are less frequent. And then in the following, I'm going to illustrate frequency in the discourse for these uh, semantic fields and for specific keywords in the following charts by looking at frequency in percent of sentences from all the newspapers by day uh, based on a seven day rolling average. And we show this in charts like the following, where we have time on the horizontal axis here, starting in January 2020, so just before the start of the pandemic in the UK, um, and then until at the end of June 2022. On the vertical axis, we've got percent of sentences uh, that goes up to 15% here. So these are really all sentences from the entire data set. So we're not looking just at articles to talk about COVID-19, but we're taking all the articles in the newspapers. Um, so if this goes up to, say, 12% here, that means that 12% of all sentences and all articles mentioned, for example, here, um, COVID-19 by one of the keywords that we identified as being a COVID-19 name, such as coronavirus or pandemic. So what we can, can we learn from this here in this chart? Uh, in blue, there's the curve for COVID-19 names. So we see um, uh, there's a first small peak and then there's a there's a very high peak at the um, um, height of the first wave of the pandemic. So there was a novelty effect. Um, uh, there was a um, um, that caused considerable public concern and was a very new topic. So people talked about it a lot um, in newspapers. And then this uh, um, reduced somewhat in frequency over time, but still in the subsequent months, more than 5% of all sentences across all newspapers mentioned COVID-19 um, by one of the keywords we identified as belonging to this area. We also have non-pharmaceutical interventions such as lockdown and mask wearing, also very frequent, um, with the peak being slightly later um, as the UK government then introduced such measures. And the third semantic field uh, that is illustrated here is vaccination, and that in the almost the entire first year, there's hardly any talk about vaccination. And uh, you might recall that actually at the start of the pandemic and during the first months, the prospect of having a viable, effective vaccine uh, was uh, very much unclear. And it was indeed surprising to some extent that we would have multiple effective vaccines fairly quickly um, during the pandemic. So really that came as a surprise and, and this is the first peak that we have here, the first news of a vaccine being available and uh, then first vaccination starts here. And then there's some talk about uh, the availability of vaccines and different vaccines that are available and how this is how this should be organized in terms of doses and so on. And we can then also um, more formally 
identify certain events or certain government measures that um, can explain um, the development of the discourse and development in the frequency of uh, these semantic fields. I already referred to this first peak. So this was the first case in the UK. Um, then we've got the first lockdown here. Um, um, so right at the beginning of the first lockdown, there's the first peak here and talk about COVID-19. Uh, we can identify um, new lockdown regulations here in the chart or the debate about these non-pharmaceutical interventions in the UK. So this was very controversial in the United Kingdom indeed. And there was a lot of to and fro by the government. Um, and we can see here multiple events where restrictions were changed or lifted um, that uh, really um, are visible here in the development of the frequency of discourse over time. And as I pointed out, these curves are seven day rolling averages. So we can, uh, in fact, also look at uh, specific values for each day um, um, in the data here. So here we've got uh, transparent points for each day in the chart. So we see actually this peak is somewhat higher. So the, the, the peak, um, if we go by day goes up to here for COVID-19 names and uh, the peak for NPIs, non-pharmaceutical interventions, goes up to here in the data at the end of the first lockdown. So the uh, variation in the data is illustrated here, as you can see, for the three semantic fields with these dots. And we can also look at um, other semantic fields um, um, and, and look at um, specific keywords there in the semantic fields like non-pharmaceutical interventions. And this is going to be relevant for the sediment analysis as well, because there we focus on these non-pharmaceutical interventions. And here the most frequent keyword is lockdown, uh, so restrictions on, um, on people's movement. And uh, we can see that this really peaks here at the end of the first lockdown, that shortly after again, and then also at the start of the second and third lockdowns in the UK. And we also have keywords such as restriction in red here, mask in green, uh, with the first peak here. This was about the availability of masks for healthcare professionals in the UK. And uh, this peak in the discourse here was about the mask mandate that the government introduced for people in general, for the general public. Uh, and there's another peak for mask here when restrictions were lifted. And we also have protect uh, in purple here. This was part of a, a slogan, uh, protect the NHS, the Net National Health Service. Uh, there was a um, slogan the government and the public used um, to communicate uh, the general strategy of the government with respect to the pandemic and how people should behave. So to, to summarize um, this, this um, part of the analysis here, we identified several factors influencing public discourse, such as the, the, the development of the pandemic with the first peak and a novelty effect, um, and also infection rates and vaccination influence the development of the discourse. We also see that government interventions such as lockdowns uh, clearly show in the discourse and the prospect of a vaccine and the start of vaccinations as well. Now, in order to understand uh, the structure of the discourse and what's going on there um, more, more specifically, we uh, took another step and conducted a sentiment analysis, which um, is a, uh, an approach that extracts and measures emotional tone or the attitude expressed in a text. It uses natural language processing and machine learning to classify text as positive, negative, or neutral, and can help us understand how people feel about topics products or services. Broadly speaking, there are two approaches. One is lexicon-based and uh, the other is machine learning based. The lexicon-based approach um, defines uh, a lexicon of positive, negative, and neutral terms uh, that, and that can be used off the shelf right away uh, for any new data. And that's, of course, uh, very easy to do, very quick, but it tends to be somewhat inaccurate because to some extent, uh, the sentiment expressed depends on context. And by comparison, the machine learning uh, based approach is more time consuming because it requires manually annotated data, but it uh, is uh, more accurate because then the analysis can really be based on the specific data and on the contextual variation found in the data with regard to sentiment. And we're going to use sentiment analysis to understand public sentiment towards COVID-related topics, such as vaccines, lockdowns, and government policies. 
and we want to also more broadly understand the impact of the pandemic on mental health, including the use of language associated with depression and anxiety more broadly. We're using a supervised machine learning approach, specifically neural networks for deep learning. We have a sample of 3000 sentences from British newspapers that were manually annotated, split into a training and test set. We had three coders who independently annotated each sentence for positive, negative, and neutral sentiment. And then we used long, shorter memory models to uh, generalize um, from these manual annotations. We had fairly good, but not perfect accuracy. And we are focusing here um, in this um, presentation on non-pharmaceutical interventions, so keywords such as lockdown, and mask. Uh, here, just a brief illustration of what we uh, annotated as positive or negative sentiment. Positive, for example, is you can see people are adhering to the COVID-19 guidelines, and we hope now to see this positivity continue right through the festive season. Or negative, it's a serious matter. Visitor attractions across the country have suffered greatly because of COVID. In this chart, uh, we see again this uh, time horizon. Um, and then on the vertical axis, we have percent of sentences classified as negative or positive uh, by the model. And this is here shown for different newspapers. So we have, for example, here on the bottom, the Times, which is a right of center broadsheet or series newspaper. We can see that negative sentiments predominate more than 50% of all sentences classified as negative and positive sentences are less than 10% here with not very much change over time. Clearly not, not as much change as we saw in the frequency of the different semantic fields and keywords. And we find similar results for the Guardian here in the middle. The Guardian is a left of center uh, broadsheet or series newspaper. Again, many negative sentiments, few positive. And we also see similar results for tablet newspapers like The Sun uh, or The Mail Online, uh, where we find uh, similar results. Um, however, what we see as a potential difference between these different newspapers is that the tabloid newspapers like The Sun or The Mail show greater variation in the sentiment expressed. So we see that the curves here uh, um, are much more uh, varied for these tablet newspapers than for the broadsheet newspapers like The Guardian and The Times. And we think this is potentially due to the uh, greater um, emotionality, uh, greater sensationalism in the tabloid newspapers than the uh, broadsheet or series newspapers. So to summarize, the sentiments around non-pharmaceutical interventions and COVID-19 are predominantly negative, as you might expect, um, given the seriousness um, of the topic and the overall negative impact on public life and um, individuals. However, against our expectations, we find no great variation between newspapers of different political orientation or target market, and we do not find any clear time trend in the data. We do find, however, that tabloids show greater variation in sentiment than broadsheets. So to summarize, we used a bottom-up approach to discourse around COVID-19 in British newspapers. We identified keywords and semantic fields in public discourse, and we also conducted a sentiment analysis to better understand public attitudes or attitudes um, um, expressed in newspapers in uh, the United Kingdom media landscape. In further work, we want to try to explain developments over time, for example, with regard to infection rates. We want to expand our sentiment analysis, and we also want to uh, better understand the impact of public discourse on healthcare utilization, as I explained at the start of the talk. We're doing this in cooperation with colleagues from the Hamburg Center for Health Economics. We're also doing a comparison with Twitter data and a comparison between the United Kingdom and Germany, as I pointed out at the very start of the talk. And uh, to wrap up, I'd like to thank all the student assistants in the project. I'd like to thank the German Research Foundation for funding and you for your attention. And now I'm looking forward to your questions and comments. Thank you very much, uh, Robert. Uh... Any question?
Um, I, I would like to, to ask a bit uh, a kind of uh, basic uh, question related to the, to the assumptions behind this uh, research. Um, because you are mentioning that uh, through this uh, analysis, we are essentially analyzing the public discourse. But the premise, if I understand well, is that this discourse is manifested through the newspapers, right? Uh, and to what extent um, is this premise uh, accurate? So, uh, um, at, at least, for instance, in Greece, there is an ongoing debate on whether uh, the discourse presented by newspapers is actually reflecting what the public is uh, thinking of or is discussing. Is it? Uh, something that uh, you have considered or is it something that is completely out of scope? No, absolutely. Case? That's a very important topic uh, to try to understand what we mean by public discourse and what different, uh, let me say, facets of public discourse we can investigate with different means. Um, so as I pointed out, we also have Twitter data. So this allows us to um, uh, look at um, individuals and what ex what opinions they express in a much, much larger number of, of, of uh, individuals. Um, this still is not a representative sample of uh, people's opinions because there are certain people on Twitter or certain demographics are overrepresented, others are underrepresented. But clearly, this is a much less filtered space where pretty much individuals voice their opinions. Whereas newspapers, uh, here we have um, a limited number of newspapers uh, that have a, an orientation towards um, a more organized discourse. We also see this in our data, that in the Twitter data we see individuals voicing their concerns, their ideas, their, their thoughts. Whereas um, in the newspapers we see much more of an orientation towards the um, the community. So what can we as a community do and how should, what are the concerns of the community in comparison to individuals? And in newspapers, we have an organized process where several people are involved in each newspaper. There's an editorial policy. Um, however, we can still consider this part of public discourse, although it's filtered organized and 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 these are institutions after all these newspapers still these are consumed very widely so they shape to a large extent what information individuals are exposed to and this in turn influences their opinions right yes yes thank you very much i see also a raised hand from long Farm, please thank you um very interesting, very insightful um, analysis here. I see quite a bit of what um, work that you have done here. My question is uh, related to the, the data collection stage. So how did you collect the data from the newspaper? Was it the, um, the online publication content or is it the physical? newspapers that you are do uh, you are uh, using and then uh, coding that how do you do that with the data collection yeah thank you uh, so we have both uh, physical newspapers and an online newspapers in the data set and we collected these through the database LexisNexis thank you thank you is there any other uh, question to Robert? If not, uh, I would like again to thank you very much, uh, Robert, for this very interesting talk. And uh, I think we are now.